I'm Dan Miller. I'm Kevin Stern. At Miller Stern Lawyers, we are honored to serve the community that we love. We work for you. For over a decade, we've spent our days and nights fighting for you. We believe in justice. We believe in fighting for what's right. That's why we are proud to sponsor a community conversation to make a better Baltimore. It takes guts to stand up for justice and accountability and demand better. And we can do it by giving you a voice in your future. At Miller Stern, we're fighting for a better Baltimore. Baltimore, Charm City, neighborhoods full of history, great people, and lots of potential. A city trying to clean up its act after years of decay. A place where children should be safe to play on clean streets. But the pockets of problems are growing. Grime and crime make for bad neighbors. And now, even the once pristine parts of our wonderful city are in the fight of their lives. To stop a city plagued by crime, grime, corruption, and failing schools. From Fox 45 News, this is a Your Voice, Your Future Town Hall the Save Our City Tour. Neighbors helping neighbors, council district by council district. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. We are in Northwest Baltimore and at the Jewish Community Center in Park Heights. I'm Mackenzie Frost and we are continuing our Your Voice, Your Future town hall series tonight. We're in District 5. As the series continues, hosting these town hall discussions in each council district all across Baltimore City. Tonight we invited Mayor Brandon Scott as well as the elected leaders who represent this area in Annapolis, including State Senator Joe Carter, State Delegate. Delegates Dolia Attar, Tonya Bridges, and Samuel Rosenberg, but they all refused. Senator Jill Carter had agreed to participate and answer questions from her constituents this evening, but yesterday morning she suddenly said she had a conflict and could not participate. We don't know what that conflict was. But tonight, for the first time as this tour continues, we do have an elected leader. We have Councilman Isaac Yitzi Schleifer, who represents this district in City Hall, to participate in this discussion. Councilman, thank you so much for joining us. We have a lot to discuss and talk about and I want to dive right into some of the biggest issues impacting your constituents but first I want to hear from you what do you think are the three biggest issues impacting and facing Baltimore City today well first thanks for having me uh, this evening and thank you to the JCC for hosting this event uh, and it's my turn to do the dishes so you guys got me out of uh, cleaning all the dishes in the sink tonight so thank you for that you're welcome um, you know there the number one issue that I see in the city the underlining issue uh, and people will be shocked to hear this, is our population. Baltimore City is a city that's built for a million people. Uh, and at one point we were really close to that, and now we're under 600,000 people. And to understand the effects that and the devastation that that has across the city uh, is to really just get down even to the, to the root of that. You know, a simple thing to think about is when those street lights come on, or when a garbage truck has to go down a street, they gotta go down that street and those lights have to come on whether one person's living on that block or 40 people are living on that block. If we got our population back up to a million people, there would be no such thing as food deserts. Uh, there would be no such thing as high unemployment. Businesses go to where people are. If there's a population, the businesses will be there. If the businesses are there, the jobs are there. If the jobs are there and unemployment uh, is virtually nothing, crime goes down. Uh, and it's the same thing when it comes, when you look at the schools. Uh, you have a lot of, a lot of schools are, have been operating for decades under capacity. Uh, some schools have been operating, uh, you know, one that was in my district at one point was operating at 20% at capacity. And so you have buildings that have um, large expenses, large overheads, but there's not a lot of students there. And so you have a lot of that money going into covering the overhead and not actually going towards uh, educating the students. And so it, it's been a real estate problem, but when you just really dig deep into any issue in the city, you will find that if our population was up and you had all those people in the city, um, you, would, you would have the resources, we would have the resources we need to address a lot of uh, the issues that we have today. And when you look at our general fund, when you look at our budget, uh, we, most of our budget goes to fixed costs. We, we have very little disposable income, disposable spending uh, as a city to tackle some of the big issues that are across the city. 
Uh, if you get, if we go from 600,000 people to a million people, that's an additional 400,000 people that are paying into that system. Yeah. It's not just property taxes, it's also income taxes. Your income taxes ultimately flow to the jurisdiction you live in. So every new person that moves into Baltimore City uh, is a net positive on our total budget um, and also gives us the ability to spend money in places that we need to, uh, like making sure we're taking care of our city employees, paying them right, and making sure that we're providing good city services uh, to people who live in Baltimore City. You brought up a lot of things that I want to talk about, and a lot of that is related, I feel like, as far as crime, education, people leaving the city because of the education system and the rising crime. But you're, like we mentioned in the open, you're the first elected member to participate in these discussions. And when it comes to solving some of these problems, the elected leaders play a, a key role in that. Why do you think it appear, or it appears that the elected leaders, for the most part, don't want to engage in that conversation? Why do you think that is? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I was invited to attend. Um, I was told there'd be elected officials attending. I'm, I'm here and I'm attending. I, I speak for myself. I speak for my district. Um, and I think it's important to engage with, uh, with the citizens of my district. Um, every year I hold a state of the district uh, address where I get in front of my entire district and tell them all the things we've, we've worked on um, that year. And so I think it's important to engage, uh, engage with um, everybody who lives in our districts. Well, we appreciate you participating, and I'm sure the people who are here to ask some questions appreciate it as well. Uh, when it comes to crime, obviously the homicide rate is on pace to surpass 300 for the seventh year in a row. Uh, the last check was 291, and we still have two months to go. What do you think is the problem when it comes to getting that under control? So, you know, it is, it is really horrifying that every year we're coming and we're, we're facing this many murders in the city. Um, I've said repeatedly the number one uh, reason why murders continue to happen and shootings continue to happen in the city is because of our clearance rate. Mm -hmm. Right now you have a greater than 50% chance of getting away with murder in Baltimore City. You have a 75% chance of getting away with a shooting in Baltimore City. And that's unacceptable. Look, I've seen firsthand the great work that the detectives uh, at BPD do. Uh, they're spread very thin. The amount of caseload that each detective is working is far more than the national standard. And what it comes down to, we're seeing time and time again that the violent repeat offenders who are committing these shootings, committing these homicides, uh, are doing it multiple times. And if we cleared a case as soon as it happened, um, not, only, not only are we holding that person accountable, we're also bringing closure to those families uh, and communities uh, that are victimized by, this, by this ongoing, uh, with these ongoing shootings and homicides. So that's what I find to be uh, the, most, uh, the most pressing issue when it comes to this, clearing those cases. And we can get into a, a couple other things, but I think that's the number one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, of, of those 291, this year there's been 13 homicides in my district. I go to just about every one uh, that I'm aware of. If I'm around, I will show up on scene. The police see me there. Uh, residents see me there. And I also follow up on those cases to see what is the root cause of each one of them, see what's going on, and how do we make sure we're solving those cases. And what I find is that when there's a lot of community engagement, when people are involved, those cases get cleared. Uh, and I have a piece of legislation that's, yep. that's before the city council right now for reward funds. Uh, and that's to really offer an equitable um, playing field across the board in the city. When you have a homicide that happens in West Baltimore uh, and Northwest Baltimore, the reward amount is, is a tremendous differential. I mean, you see a typical shooting or homicide will have a two to $4,000 reward. Uh, if there's um, a homicide in, in, in more affluent communities, sometimes you'll see rewards hit uh, 20,000, 30,000, even $100,000. And, and what I see is that um, families and, and communities that are being plagued by this violence they all want these cases solved. Mm -hmm. They do not want uh, this to continue. And so my bill would create a non-lapsing fund that would be part of the city charter that the voters would ultimately decide on if it took law. And across the board, every single shooting, every single homicide, armed carjackings, all violent crime would have increased rewards to a substantial amount where people who, who see something will say something and will, will give over that information. And I saw that firsthand in my district. Um, most, most crimes that, that have occurred in my district um, have been one of two things. Uh, of the 13, majority of them have been uh, drug related, mm -hmm. um, related to the drug dealing that's been occurring. Um, and the other thing has been domestic cases. Now, when you see a case, there's a high profile case in my district where there's a tourist visiting, uh, visiting uh, for the first time, 
that was a, a robbery gone wrong. Yep. Uh, for everything points to that. And when you see a random case like that, it's, it's very difficult to solve a crime like that where there's no motive. Um, you don't know who, the, there's, there's no internet, you don't know who the people are. Uh, you're really starting from, from nothing to figure that out. And there was a large reward offered in that case. And the phones rang off the hook. And people who um, saw a car driving down the street when they were coming home from the airport called and said, hey, I saw this car, or I saw this, or I saw that, and you know, most of it wasn't necessarily pinpointing to anything, but there were people who gave tips that led to the evidence being discovered really quickly, led to very important information, and that case, which, which in most cases would go completely unsolved, was solved within, uh, within one month. And those individuals who are responsible for that are in jail, and they're facing life, they're facing life in prison right now. Do you think that without that reward money and that, that possibility of getting some of that money do you think that helped solve the case? Without the, it, would it have gone cold? So you know, the reward the reward definitely helps. Yeah. Because uh, every piece of information, not only does it help, it also helps the detective solve the case quicker. You know, these detectives are working around the clock. Um, you know, they're dedicated. They want to solve these crimes, and when they don't, when when they have to do it all on their own, every piece of information, every camera, every piece of camera footage they have to look through, can take hours. And so having the community, having information come, you know, come to them will save them time, also saves the police department a lot of money and over time. And I think ultimately in that case, uh, it was really a combination. The community really came together. Uh, people uh, said, this is not acceptable. We're not going to put up with this. Uh, and you had the entire, um, you know, the entire community surrounding that incident um, coming together, going on a walk, bringing attention to the matter, um, and saying, we're just not going to tolerate this. And I think that that's what, that's what it takes when you have people coming together, working with the police department, working with the leaders. Uh, that's how you solve crimes. I remember that case, and I remember all of those walks going out in, in the community that happened, it seemed like, very frequently, that yeah. everyone was out there looking. When it comes to police officers, you mentioned that the police department short-staffed. Everyone is doing what they can, but there are very few resources. Why do you think the police department continues to struggle with recruitment and retention of officers? You know, it's, an, it's, it's another interesting point you bring up, and, you know, there was... There's been a lot of talk about um, retirement mm -hmm. and the benefits that are provided. Typically, people who work in government, they, they're making less money than they would in the private sector. And so they're dedicating their careers for the greater good of the city, greater good of the community. Um, and one of the issues that I've, I've found is that there's uncertainty in the future. And you know, I had a hearing, I called for a hearing recently about the drop fund. There was, uh, right now, officers that are eligible to retire uh, would get an additional percentage uh, of their retirement if they stay on additional years. Right now, we mm -hmm. know um, we, we have a shortage of officers. And getting, you know, even though recruitment efforts have ramped up and the police department has really um, done, done great work in recruiting, there has been, you know, you have a lot of officers that are retiring or leaving for other jurisdictions. And so there used to be an incentive where they'd get eight and a quarter percent uh, to stay on for additional few years. It has now been reduced to three and a quarter percent. And so that equation has really changed. So those officers that have the most institutional knowledge uh, that uh, we might need to stay on for a few extra years you know, we, we don't have that same incentive in place, so we held a hearing with that, uh, with the retirement system, and really asked them to do a study to look at if there's a way to, to create that incentive, or also to create other incentives for officers that are leaving, uh, that are leaving before their, their career's up. To stay on the force. Yes. When it comes to the, the reward money, quickly, do, have you talked to the mayor about it, and do you think that that will move forward? So the reward fund right now, um, it is, it's at the, we just had our first hearing. We're gonna have a work session coming up next month. Um, and the process is once that, once we have that second work session, hopefully the uh, committee will vote it out. It'll go to the full council for a vote. And if eight council people believe it's a good idea, uh, then it goes to the mayor's desk for a signature. I mean, the mayor uh, has been, you know, has been part of the crime fight. He has been, um, you know, really looking for different solutions and, and solving crime. He's, he's done that as a council person and he's been doing that as mayor also. Uh, and so I'm confident that the administration will support it. Uh, they want to solve these crimes as bad as anybody else. And we know that it's a proven method. And the greatest thing about that, it's one of the few places that uh, the return on investment uh, pays off tenfold. Uh, you don't pay out the reward if the information doesn't come forward mm -hmm. that leads to the arrest and conviction of the criminals. And so it's one of those things that doesn't cost us anything or doesn't cost anything at all unless it works. When it comes to selective enforcement of the law, do you think that's a problem and is that contributing to the growing crime in the city? 
Um, you know, I think that there's there's an inconsistency of of punishment when mm -hmm. people th there's really that lack on on the street of of consistency of what is going to actually happen. Like I've been in I've been in the courtrooms where same case, armed carjacking, the exact opposite arguments made, judges give the same ruling, and I look at that and I say it just doesn't make any sense. And so if people don't realize that. There's, that there's a consistency in punishment that if you commit these violent crimes, you will be held accountable, uh, then it just leads to more lawlessness. And so I think that that's where really uh, the direction that we all need to go in. There's three steps of the criminal justice system, and all three steps need to do their, their part um, to lead to the reduction of crime. And I find cases, good cases, that have all the evidence necessary get to that last step and uh, and the law isn't really being applied uh, to it. And so when, when I hear, I hear often people say, you know, do you think we should change the law? Do you think we should change this law? My feeling is we should start by enforcing the laws we have. And by doing that, you'll find that crime will go down because when somebody commits an armed carjacking, when somebody shoots somebody and they're held accountable, they're gonna realize that that behavior is not gonna be tolerated. Who's responsible for those inconsistencies that we're seeing in the system? Well, the examples that I gave, that I've seen in the courtroom. So it would be the judges uh, that I've seen, how they've applied the law. And so it's not all judges, it's not everybody across the board, but when you have, you have the police officers who build this case, spend all this time doing it, the state's attorney comes in there and is, and is pushing for the, the appropriate sentence, and then the judges say, you know, look, we're gonna, we're gonna give you a slap on the wrist and you're back out. Well, that you know, that's really leads to that inconsistency of, of how the law is being applied. How do you fix that? I think you bring attention to it, you bring transparency to it. So that's another thing I've been working on. Um, so as, as I'm sure you've heard many times, Baltimore City uh, Council cannot legislate, the mm -hmm. police department can't legislate a lot, a lot of these laws, the state does have preemption, but at the end of the day, we do contribute from our budget to these things, and so uh, we certainly have a seat at the table. And. Uh, I've taken that fight to Annapolis. Um, one of my delegates, Delegate Attar, uh, she put in this bill this past legislative session to, uh, to bring transparency to these cases mm -hmm. and to uh, essentially hold the judges um, and, and they're all parties accountable to know, who's, you know what police officers are working in the case, what, what uh, state's attorney, uh, assistant state's attorney is prosecuting the case, and what judges ruled on the case so you could actually see the data, so you can actually see the information. You can't begin to fix the problem unless you have the full scope of what the issue is. Um, and it's hard because a lot of these records are completely sealed so you have no idea what happens. If your neighbor is, um, is carjacked you know, at gunpoint and um, it was done by a juvenile, of course the juvenile's information shouldn't be released. You know, it's, it's protected by law and it should be protected. However, the end result, that, that's stuff that the community wants to know. They want to know, you know, what were services provided to this, uh, to this uh, youth that committed this crime? Is something being done to help them? And far, far too often we find out that the system uh, has, been failing, has been failing these children who, who want to do the right thing. Um, and you see, that, you see that across the board when it comes to, uh, to the squeegee issue. You have, um, you have people, uh, youth, who are going and, and squeegeeing. Mm -hmm. They're essentially saying, and I've, I've spoken to, to some of the, the squeegee uh, youth before, they don't want to sell drugs. They're out there doing that because they want to do, they want to make money, but they don't want to be dealing drugs. They don't want to go into that life uh, of, of, of dealing drugs and, and doing other, um, other crimes like that. But at the same time, it's also a dangerous behavior right. uh, that needs attending to. Uh, but but I, what I'm seeing when I go into the schools in my district, and I have some great schools in my district, um, with some great principals in my district, it's all about the leadership. When I go into those schools and I talk to high school students, they don't want to be part of the crime. It, it, it tears them up that they are seeing their friends and family members being killed on the streets. And so they want to see something change too. Um, and so I think it's on, it's on us to, to provide those other outlets. And you know, if I could, could mention one program that I think has done an excellent job, uh, there's an entrepreneur program uh, called Heart Smiles. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are in the high schools uh, offering entrepreneurship opportunities, teaching children. Like, you know, school isn't for everybody. College isn't for everybody. And so, you know, they're teaching them, like, to be a business owner, to create generational wealth. Um, and I've spoken at the program many times. I've participated in a lot of their, their programs. And what I find is that they're going to the kids and saying, what is it that you want to do? Mm -hmm. 
and um, and that works. And and those children are not uh, joining joining the um, you know the life of crime. Those children are trying to start businesses and be successful for themselves and for their family. We've seen the squeegee youth or kids get into some pretty violent attacks, however, at some of the, the corners where they're known to be. What do you think could be done? I mean, is should the squeegee kids be, should they be told to leave by the police? Should the police be taking a more active role in clearing some of the corners to prevent some of these assaults that we've seen play out? Sure. So, you know, this goes back to, um, there was a meeting in City Hall five, four or five years ago. And uh, the mayor, Mayor Pugh at the time, uh, that was the topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. It was like sort of like a round table meeting and uh, we're having, all having conversation with it. And I, and I had um, a point that I brought up. I had asked somebody, how many, how many squeegee youth do you think are out there actually on a regular basis working, working out there? And the, the number that was given at the time was about 50. Okay. And I said, wow, that's a simple issue to solve. Bring all 50 of them, invite them all to meet with the mayor. Bring them into City Hall, the mayor's conference room, serve them lunch, and have a business meeting. And go around the room and say to each one of those students, what is it that you want to do? And if, if one student says, you know, I'm a huge football fan, I'd love to work for the Ravens. You know what? You're the mayor. You call the Ravens and you say, do you have an opportunity for this, for this um, you know, 12th grade student? Somebody wants to work for the Orioles, you do the same thing. Somebody wants to go into construction, same thing. We have the ability as city leaders to get um, to, you know, with the, the mayor's office of employment to get these, get these students jobs. Mm -hmm. And that was a solution at the time that I thought was very doable um, and could happen actually pretty quickly. Instead, what they opted to do was create a program. They spent a million dollars and the issue only got worse. And what they did was they actually um, got merchandise and um, branding mm -hmm. for, I think they, they called it the squeegee corpse, and they held car washes on the cobblestone of City Hall. Uh, that was the exact opposite uh, solution. That was like a short term, like, okay, let's, you know, let's, let's support that. That didn't work, and that would never work. And so the issue went from 50 students to now there's hundreds. And it's not too late. It's not too late to go to these, to these youth, and just nobody's asking them, what is it that you want to do? Every single one of them wants to do something. They want to be successful. They don't want to be cleaning car windshield wipers. They don't. They don't want to be cleaning your car when you go downtown. Now, I have one squeegee worker in my district. Uh, he's very respectful. There hasn't been a single issue um, at all. Uh, he, you know, when he's, he'll ask you if you want your windows clean. If you say no, it ends there. Um, and you know, and that's and that's the vast majority of them. But of course, you do have some some squeegee workers. It's it's a tiring job to stand out there. You know, you're dodging traffic all day. It's very dangerous, um, and it, and it shouldn't continue. But what we need to do uh, is we need to give them opportunities, and we have the ability to do that. There's so many available jobs right now uh, that you can work in any field you want at this point. In this in this day and age, right. there's so many. Um, there's so many businesses in the city that are looking to hire, that are looking to grow, and there's real opportunities out there to address the need of every single one of those students, but you need, you need to bring them in, and you need to talk to them, not talk at them. Has Mayor Brandon Scott done that? Do you know? Um, I'm not familiar with it. I know they are, they are working on the issue. Um, you know, and the mayor, the mayor's out there on the street. I mean, I've seen, I guess, even though I'm just in my first, uh, first year of my second term, I've been through now uh, a few mayors, yeah. um, even more police commissioners, and you know this mayor really cares. I mean, he grew up he grew up in Park Heights, uh, and he's out there. He's out there on the street. I mean, when I'm when I see an incident take place or I see something going on, the mayor is there. He shows up and he talks to me and he does what he can, um, and and he certainly cares. I mean, look, I'm the youngest council person. Um, that, that's on the city council right now. He's also one of the youngest mayors um, to be in Baltimore City, and so he understands the issues, um, and he's working tirelessly to do it. I mean, he hasn't completed his first year yet, uh, but he certainly does want to address it um, the same way the rest of us do. It sounds like... One second, if you have a question, if you have a question, you are more than welcome to come to Riel, who will direct your questions over here. And it looks like we have some people who are ready to go and ask some of those questions. One second. 
We've got a lot of people down City Hall. Just sir, like sir, I'm happy to respond to you sir, if you want to come to the mic. If you want to come and ask a question, that's great. We, we, we do I'm have one person that. here that, that's ready to ask a question. And I think it's something that's relative to what we've been talking about. Sure. It deals with crime. This is Bilal Ali. Yes. Former representative, former delegate, rather, for District 41, so a former elected official himself, talking about crime. He does see something that he hasn't seen put into action. Well, basically, we have had crime plans after crime plans, but they were more focused on law enforcement as opposed to dealing with the underlying cause. I understand about population and things like that, but the elephant in the room is, is out of that population, that 600,000 that you mentioned, one-fourth of that popula population lives in poverty or below, and they don't have a living wage. So we have to defocus. We, we, we don't take a real deep dive into the infrastructure issues. Uh, you mentioned schools, but nobody mentions the fact that Baltimore City uh, has some of the oldest uh, facilities of any jurisdictions in the state of Maryland. That's the issue. If education is a draw for young families to come to Baltimore City, how are we going to attract new families to come to those type of facilities? The other thing that I find uh, very important is that we talk about the squeegee kids, we talk about crime and et cetera. But my thing is we need to replace guns with opportunity. We have become a city, the tale of two cities, just like Charles Dixon, where you have one that's affluent and the other one lives in poverty or concentrated poverty. And until we address those issues, then crime is not going to uh, uh, disappear. And one last comment. We have to stop putting our faith in elected officials. Uh, that, I, mean, I mean, that's the bottom line. It, no mayor, no elected official have all the answers because the problems are so complex that we just can't do it. Obviously, a lot to, to take on there, Gitsy, but, but that is the one thing. How, when he's talking about elected officials, sure. how do you really, as an elected official, address this when exactly what he says? The problems are very complex. Sure. So, you know, the way I look at it is if you want to, you know, if you want to be a player in the, in, in the solution, you have to understand the rules of the game. And so in the city, we have a city charter that governs how we operate and what is within our power and what we can control. And so uh, Mr. Ali brought up a very good point in the beginning of his comments, which is when it comes to poverty and it comes to salaries. Uh, and we know that, you know, it's, it's so important that people to be able to provide for their families and to be able to, to make uh, wages where they can create generational wealth. And, and I've seen in the city that we have not done that inside the city to city employees. And one of, the, you know, one of the main agencies I'll talk about on that is, is DPW. We have, we have solid waste workers. That is one of the most difficult jobs in the city, to stand on the back of a trash truck uh, in the snow, in the rain, lightning, thunder, you name it, global pandemic. They're standing on the back of these, uh, of, of these trash trucks collecting all of our trash. Because if our trash doesn't get picked up, we'll lose the city. And so, you know, I, I realized that that's a big problem. And I looked into that and I talked to um, the sanitation workers that, that come by my house um, every week. And I try to bring out drinks to them. And I, you know, I try to engage with them and, and understand some of the things that they're going through to see how I, as a city leader, can address that. And what I found out was very disturbing. I found out there was um, sanitation workers who were working on the back of the trucks making as little, I think it was $9 an hour, $11. It was, the, it was, it was 10, 10, $11 an hour. I, I was mortified when I heard that, and I immediately got to work, and, and I held hearings on it. And although I don't control that, that's an executive decision, I took that to the previous mayor, um, and, and I pushed for it. And every single one of those temporary workers, they were reclassified as full-time workers. Every single one of those workers got over $6 an hour raise to begin with, full city benefits, uh, and they're no longer temporary workers. Um, the gentleman who, who 
comes by my house once a week uh, to pick up, to pick up uh, the garbage that we put out. He, to he told me he's been a temporary worker for I think it was a year and a half at that point. And I was like, that's, that's not temporary, that's permanent. And so um, I worked on that. My colleagues on the city council said, this is an issue that we have, to, we have to address and we have to address it immediately. How are we gonna go to the private sector and tell the private sector what to do? when in our own house, in our own uh, DPW, the workers are not being treated fair. And so my colleagues jumped on board. I mean, the support for that was unanimous. Every single member of this Baltimore City Council wants to make sure the employees are paid, paid well, and they all fought for that. And, and not only, not only did, we, did we accomplish that together, we also uh, pushed for bonuses. Um, at the time, there was uh, some federal funding coming in back then, and we asked for $5,000 bonuses for every single sanitation worker that worked through the pandemic. The previous mayor gave us $500. That was 500 more than, than those workers were gonna get as a bonus before Christmas last year. And that's something that myself and my colleagues worked on and ultimately made happen by lending our voice to it. So to answer your question, Mr. Ali, you know, we have to get, we have to get our own house in order. In the city, we have to continue to make progress um, and take care of those workers. And when you look at where the sanitation workers live, almost all of them live in Baltimore City. And so by, by giving back to those workers who are taking care of us, it, we're not just helping them and their families, we're actually helping our economy because now they have money to spend, they have, they have money to afford um, you know, their homes and to afford uh, gifts for their children and clothing and, um, and food that the $6 an hour raise is, is pretty significant. And so those are the kinds of things that we can do as city leaders and, and we're doing it. You know, there's, there's a lot of challenges, but you know, at least we're, we're starting on some of those. Riel, thank you so much for those, those questions. We'll be back for more questions from our audience. You bring up federal funding, and I want to talk about, because we know that there's going to be $641 million coming to the city from the federal government, from the American Rescue Plan. Where do you think that money should be spent, and do you agree with the way it's being allocated thus far? Well, certainly, you know, I, I think that there needs to be broader discussions on where it needs to be spent. Uh, we have we have multiple years to complete the spending. It's not something like the previous right. funding had to be spent by the end of that year. Uh, this funding is is geared a little differently, and so you know I agree. The mayor has rolled out two two separate things. He started off with public health, which in a global pandemic that needs to be the focus. Um, and so starting with with things on public health, and then you know the number two announcement was public safety. Now. We don't have all the details yet of you know how all that money is going to be spent. That's still being developed, uh, but you know the city council uh, and the mayor are going to come together and work on some of those details. And they're going to work, and we're going to work on you know how that funding should be spent. We're going to have regular hearings on it um, and regular engagement. The city council um, passed um, a resolution um, to to have monthly hearings on the topic, and so we we know we understand how important it is. Um, and we want to work with the mayor's office and the administration uh, to figure out how that money is going to be spent. And, you know, it's just the beginning and money. We, we just got the allocation recently. Um, and I think the next four years is going to be very important on how we can spend it. Personally, um, I see that there's a, a backlog of a tremendous amount of um, basic city services that, that, are, that need to be done. And so I think you have to start with, with the quality of life in the city. You got to start with um, the things that people are paying taxes for. So, you know, we all pay taxes in the city. We want that money to go to covering our basic city services. And so that's where we need to start before, um, you know, before trying to, um, you know, jump all in on one thing or another. Uh, I think we have an opportunity um, to clear out a lot of the 311 backlogs that we have. And that would just be a drop in the bucket. We'd still have opportunities to, to for generational change, for capital projects, for other some really significant things in every single council district in the city. But I think we have to start with the basic city services. Going back to public safety, I know $22 million was allocated for programs like Safe Streets. Do you think that, one, is that enough money or is that too much money for those programs like that? And do you think those details of the public safety allocation from the American Rescue Plan should have been hashed out before it was publicly rolled out and announced in a big fanfare press conference? So I, there was $50, 50 million, excuse me, that was that was designated to public safety. Correct. Uh, a lot of that, the, um, either the mayor's office is asking for input uh, from the citizens now on where all that money should go. Um, to my knowledge, there isn't a set dollar amount for any specific organization. 
Um, programs but, like Safe Streets, they'll yeah. have to apply. It's the community-based intervention programs that will get the $22 million and then put those programs apply for grants funding. Look, I, I look, the way I look at it is there's a lot of programs out there in different communities. We have successful programs in my district. We have successful programs in other districts across the city. There's some of Safe Streets programs um, that have had, had success, some of them that haven't had the same success as other ones. And so, uh, you know, I can't, you can't uh, paint the broad brush but I'm all about supporting what works and not funding what doesn't work. And so there needs to be a reasonable proposal, see where that money's gonna go, and then there needs to be a cost-benefit analysis on every single expenditure like that. When we, when we look at spending five million, 10 million, 20 million dollars on an item, they need to explain how we're getting a good return on our investment. Mm -hmm. And I go back to the reward fund. That is one that has a phenomenal return on investment, and most importantly, costs nothing unless it works. Do you think that those details, you said the mayor is asking for community input, why put a dollar amount on these programs and public safety budgets before you even get any sort of input? So that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think that when you're thinking broad, the broad scope and how this $641 million is being spent, you have to start with a framework. You gotta, you gotta start somewhere, you can't just you know, back into it because there's a lot of competing interests across the board. Um, depending on where you are in the city, they'll tell you, you know, what's, what their priority is and where they want that money spent. And there's not enough money to, to solve everybody's priority. And so you, you do need to create some business plan, some framework. And I think that's what the mayor's office is doing right now. They're saying, look, public health, we need to get out of this pandemic. So that is the first, first and foremost. Uh, then public safety, we all know, is, is a very pressing matter. We have to address that. And so coming up with that framework is important. And I think there needs to be room, leftover room for other monies to be spent once we figure out the full scope. But I mean, I don't think anybody can argue that, that $50 million is worthwhile to spend on public safety. I mean, there's no, you can't put a value on, on all the human lives that are being lost on the street. And so um, there's no amount of money that, you know, that would be enough today to solve that problem today. And so um, I think that they're just creating that framework. When it comes to, you mentioned this earlier, the sense of lawlessness in some communities across Baltimore. We've heard from people that there's some confusion between the police department and the city state's attorney's office. Do you think the prosecution policies that were announced this year have played a role in some of the sense of lawlessness or crimes that are going unpunished, the drug possession issues? Where do you stand on that? So look, there's, there's uh, certainly a lack of communication across the board when it comes to all city agencies. Uh, what I'm looking at and what I'm speaking on behalf of is my district. Um, and I can tell you that when it comes to, to crimes in my district, I, you know, I'm grateful that I have a police department that is working hard on those issues. I have a state's attorney who's very present also on issues in my district. Um, and even showing up at court on that. I think the last step to that really is, is how are we going to get the judicial system, how are we going to get the judges to, to enforce the laws that are on the books? Do you think that the state's attorney's office isn't enforcing the laws that are on the books right now? So I follow, I follow high prior, like all the priority cases in my district, the violent crime. That's not, that hasn't been my experience. Um, so when we, when we talk about the case like the one that we mentioned mm -hmm. in um, that murder in my district, those, those individuals were caught. Uh, the state's attorneys are asking for, for life sentences for all of them. Uh, that, that's, that's what the family wants. That's what the community uh, communities are asking for serious penalties. Obviously, there, there's also an option, you know, for all but a certain amount of the year suspended. Mm -hmm. um, and so the state's attorney's office is following the cases, at least the cases in my district, I have seen the state's attorney showed up to court herself. Um, you know, I was sitting in, I was sitting in court um, on a, an arm, there was an armed carjacking spree that was going on in my district. Uh, a few years back, I'm sitting there in, uh, in the court for the transfer hearing, the state's attorney showed up and sat, sat right there as well. And, um, and they asked for, for the law to be applied. And so um, I can't answer for everything that's going on across the city. Uh, certainly, I think it's, um, it, when there's lack of, when there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lack of communication, and, and the information doesn't flow all the way down um, to, the, you know, to all levels of the police department, all levels of the agencies, I think what we find is that um, people, don't, people aren't aware. And so it's, it's very important to improve those, those levels of communication so that people understand 
um, what that that the laws need to be need to be enforced. And so, um, you know, there's there are there are some open air drug markets across the city. Um, to my knowledge, and I'm seeing at least from in my district, uh, when when there's a case, when there's arrest being made uh, for drug dealers, it's being prosecuted. Um, and so, you know, those those folks, it's the same folks over and over again. I can tell you spots in my district. I, I know I know the names of some of these folks because they've been to court multiple times. And when, if you left here and went straight out to those locations, you'd see the same individuals dealing drugs in the same exact spots. And even when they're arrested, um, they're back out and doing doing the exact same thing. The policies have essentially decriminalized drug possession right now in the city. Do you think that that promotes a sense of lawlessness? No, when people know that they can do it and not get arrested and not go to court. So the, the broad issue, and we're seeing like when we look at the 13 murders that occurred in my district, um, a lot of them are connected directly to drug dealing. Um, so even some of the recent ones, there's a, on, on the gas station, uh, one of the gas stations locally here, um, there was there was a, a turf war, so to say. Um, I saw the video footage myself, uh, and it's, you know, people are killing each other over, you know, over drug dealing. Right. And so, you know, it's, it's a different, there's a, there's a completely different scenario when you're talking about, you know, drug possession or, you know, or some of the drugs like, like marijuana. You can illegally obtain marijuana. There's dispensaries all across the city. Um, and so it's important that the illegal ones, the illegal, the, the, People who are dealing drugs illegally are held accountable, um, and and that we don't, you know, and that we don't uh, allow that to continue. Because what we're seeing is that uh, people are fighting, they're pulling guns, and they're shooting each other, really over just, um, you know, over some drug dealing territories. When it comes to the communication that you say is is not happening, isn't that the responsibility of the police commissioner and the city state's attorney to make sure that everyone is on the same page so they know, the officers know what is the law, what can be arrested, and what essentially will then be charged and prosecuted in court? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it all it all starts at the top, including all of us city leaders. I mean, it's important that we all are aware of, um, you know, that we communicate down to our staff. And I'll use that as a, as a gateway. I, I have my same staff that I had since I started five years ago. Uh, Shelly, Shaquetta, Maxine, they're all here with us in the back. So if anybody has any constituent service uh, requests, you can, uh, you can go back to them and, and ask them any questions or they'll take down your information and follow up. But yeah, it's important. And I, you know, I, I see even with my own staff that I have to communicate to them, you know, when different things are changing or there's something going on in the district because we're all working on things nonstop. And I can't know everything that they worked on each day, et cetera. So there has to be that flow of communication. So certainly, as it pertains to all agencies, whether it be police department, state's attorney's office, the judicial system, the um, juvenile justice system, right. there needs to be that level of communication that people are all on the same page because you don't have that consistency. Um, and so the same, the same exact scenario, like I mentioned in the beginning of, of this town hall, the same scenario has two very different outputs, and that's not good. And, and, and people who are committing criminal acts on the streets of Baltimore see that, and they see that inconsistency, um, and they're playing the odds. And the odds, unfortunately, are in their favor right now because, like I mentioned, you have a 50, greater than 50 percent chance of getting away with murder and a 75 percent chance of getting away with a shooting in the city. And we can't allow that to continue. All right, let's go back to Riel Creighton, my colleague, who is taking questions from members of the audience. Riel, I see you have more people there. What are you hearing and what types of questions do the audience members have for the councilman? Well, one of the questions, uh, and this comes from Mecca Mohammed, she had a question about something you touched on earlier, Councilman, about population and the decline of population. She wanted to know how do you attract people back in the city, but she also had a question more related to specifically your role in city government. Good evening, Councilman. Good evening. Um, my question to you is, can you explain what you, as being the chair of the Le Legislative Oversight Committee, does for the residents of Baltimore City? And being the chair of the Legislative Oversight Committee, y'all ha have a role that you play as in representing the people. Now, how are you going to bring population control or have an effect with population control and you have a responsibility as the Le Legislative Oversight Chair? So thank you for that question. Um, and that's a very good one. The role of, of my committee, the Rules and Legislative Oversight, 
is to is to hold oversight hearings and uh, certain bills are referred to us. So in the legislative process, every council member and the administration can introduce pieces of legislation. The council president's office then figures out which is the best committee for that legislation to go to. So if it's a piece of public safety legislation, he'll refer to the public safety committee. If it's an education related legislation or topic, he'll refer that to the education committee. If it's health or technology, he'll refer to that. And there's other, other topics such as like water billing, uh, which is a big issue that we've held hearings as recently as this week on. Uh, a lot of those, those topics, the other oversight for other agencies, uh, that would be referred to the Rules and Legislative Oversight Committee, as well as also the executive appointments of all cabinet members, uh, mayor's cabinet members, and also uh, other bureau heads um, in different agencies, we handle the confirmation hearings, which also gets to, you know, we talk about some of the broader issues uh, in the city. It also, you know, leads into when you have, um, you know, we have like the, like the BMZA, for instance, the zoning board, they come before us and, they, and, and they're appointed by us. But one of the most important boards, if not the most important one in the city, does not come to us, and that's the school board. And so the school board uh, does not come before, before the city council. And it's also, it's not a paid position. And so the BMZA or liquor board, uh, there's stipends and, and money that goes to those, uh, those folks who are giving of their time. Uh, and, that, and that's something that I think uh, needs to be addressed. I mean, you need to have um, school board members. First of all, I think they should be elected. Uh, that's number one. But I think they should also be paid. I think it's, it's, not a, it's not a volunteer position. It's not something that you can do on your spare time. The, the needs are great, and the attention that needs to be spent on it is great. And people need to be compensated, and we need to attract uh, the right folks with the right level of expertise um, to, to address that. You, you mentioned education, and I want to pivot and talk about that because right now we're seeing some failures that have been brought to light in a, in a handful of Baltimore City public schools. The CEO, Dr. Sonia Santelisis, do you think that she has done an adequate job in her role, or do you think that somebody else should be in that position to lead the Baltimore City public school system? Sure. So. So the CEO, um, that's not, that's not the, the role of a city council person does not have the ability to hire or fire um, a, a school CEO. Right. That you have an that, opinion about yeah, her. That is the sole, that's the sole discretion of, of the school board. Now what I will say, what I've seen, um, and, and you guys have brought important, important things to light, things that um, a lot of folks were not aware of, things that I wasn't aware of. And um, some of those items are being addressed, and what, what I find at least in my own district, is it varies based on the school. Mm -hmm. It varies based on leadership. And, it, and I hear time and time again that people say, it depends on the neighborhood. It doesn't depend on the neighborhood. And my district is proof of that, that when you look at certain schools, when you look at the Arlington School, for instance, in my district, right over here on Rogers Avenue, um, and there's a lot of poverty issues um, in the community over there, they have an excellent principal. Uh, principal Hunter lives and breathes that school. And every time I go in there, the kids are learning, they're, they're having fun, the school is well run, it's been renovated, it's a 21st century school, uh, and it's, it, it's gorgeous in there. I mean, and the kids really, um, they appreciate coming to school every day and all their needs are being met there. They're getting, they're getting food there, um, they're, getting, they're getting an education there. And you know, I was there, I was there this past week, they had a, a trunk or treat in the parking lot. I participate every year with that, bring candy for the kids. And, and the kids love coming to school there. And uh, those kids in, in some of those neighborhoods there have just as many um, food insecurities and poverty issues in some of the hardest hit neighborhoods in the city. But they have an excellent principal. And it comes, it's, it's all leadership. That's what it comes down to, it's leadership. It starts at the top. When you have the right people in the right positions, you get the right outcome. What, what you've seen is that in different scenarios, if you have the wrong people in the wrong positions, you get the wrong outcome. And you can't continue to do the same thing and expect a different result. And so, look, I think people need to be promoted based on uh, people who are having success. Do what's working and don't do what's not working. And there's a lot of dedicated uh, teachers, um, principals in the schools across the city that come to work every single day um, and give it their all. Uh, and they need to have the right support but on the flip side, you know, you find, you find schools that don't have that, that people who are promoted for, for the wrong reasons or, you know, 
came through the ranks and they're in a position that, you know, even though they have the best of intentions, they're not equipped to handle. Um, being a principal is, is a lot of hats to wear. Um, you have to understand the education system very well. You have to understand operations. Uh, and you have to have a, a high level of compassion for the students. And, and when you see schools that have that, they're successful. And I've, you know, I've been very fortunate to have some of the best schools in the city in my district. You alluded to a Project Baltimore investigation into Augusta Fells. That was where we learned that there were ghost students and grade changing schemes that were happening. Did those findings surprise you or upset you or concern you at all about the level of education that was happening in various schools across the city? You know, of course it's concerning. I mean, this gets back, this ties directly into the squeegee issue, is that you have students, and, in, and also the juvenile justice system, you have mm -hmm. students, you have people who are crying out for help that want, they want to have a better life. And, um, and, and, and at times the systems, different systems are failing them. And so, you know, passing somebody up from grade to grade or class to class that they're not equipped for does not help them. You know, we all know, we've, we've all been through, through school and we've seen certain kids who are held back a year or something. And, you know, that's, that's what that individual child needs. And, um, you know, I wouldn't want my, my children to be elevated to a next grade level if they weren't ready for it. And so it's important that, um, that, that folks who are doing that and are participating in that are held accountable because they're, they're, not, they're not just covering themselves, they're failing these students and they're also failing the generations because if you don't allow that student to, to catch up to where they need to be to grade level, they can never catch up because you can't, you can't um, not be ready for, for second grade and go to second grade because then when you're in third grade, you're not ready for third grade. You're, you're not even ready for second grade yet. You still haven't finished first right. grade. And so, um, you know, that, that behavior, um, I'm, you know, I'm glad it's come to light. And, um, and we see, you know, there seems to be some movement going on. And hopefully the message has been sent across the board that that, that kind of behavior is not going to be tolerated. And you have to understand, you know, you, you see from different parents and you, mm -hmm. and you see what, what people are saying about years later what effect it's had. Absolutely. And so, so people sometimes, leaders sometimes at the time don't realize the impact of certain decisions they make. And don't get me wrong, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody, you know, does it. But if you're intentionally doing something like that, that, that you know is wrong and that you know is not going to help that student, um, you don't belong in that position. You said leaders, leadership <clears throat> impacts the way that various schools can be run and that can make or break a, a school or student. When it comes to leadership of the school system, isn't it up to the CEO to make sure that what was happening doesn't happen and should she be held accountable? So look, you know, I've seen in the school system, now I'm, I'm not on the education committee, so I'm, I'm not um, at the table for all of those discussions, but what I will say I, I have seen, um, I have seen progress in, in some regards. Um, you know, one, one of the recent cases, what we heard and what everybody had, you know, suspected was going to happen, that, you know, they were going to open up the schools and COVID was going to spread through all of them and, and all the schools were going to be shut down. That didn't happen. You know, there were protocols put in pray, place. There was operationally things that were done um, in, in these schools to prevent that mass spread throughout the school system so that school could stay open. Now. You know, this, the, the underlining issue really gets back to, to what I had mentioned in the beginning of this town hall, is the money, the money hasn't made it to the students. The city, there's been city leaders in the past, growing up I remember, you know, seeing, you know, different times where, you know, people will, will push for, you know, certain school to stay open, right? Mm -hmm. Even though it's only operating at 20% capacity. And when you have overheads of buildings that cost Million, a million plus dollars a year, uh, the amount per pupil doesn't actually make it to the students. I mean, you're, you're talking about uh, a system that has been real estate, you know, has, has had too much real estate than they can afford. And so I think, you know, the, the delegation um, in Annapolis, I know, um, you know, I know um, a lot of the, the Annapolis leaders in the past have, have worked, uh, Maggie McIntosh worked very hard also on this, on getting a lot of the 21st century schools uh, pro built in the city. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I have some of them in my district. And what we're seeing now is we're right-sizing it. But you have, you have decades of over expenditures on buildings mm -hmm. and overhead and keeping the lights on and keeping the water running that, 
that money, the money didn't make it to the students, that didn't make it to art classes, that didn't make it to music classes, that didn't make it to assistant principals. And so what, what you constantly find is that you have those, you know, you have in those, those scenarios, the money's not getting to the right place. You mentioned Arlington School. We, that school itself, you said, is in your district. The students like coming to class. Um, they're ranked two out of ten when it comes to test scores. So students may like coming to class, but it, their test scores show that they're not actually learning. How do you how do you change that? So, so again, they're in an area where they have all the challenges that that I've explained happen in in some of the hardest hit areas in the city, and so when you have that you have to have the students show up. I mean, there's, there's times where you have students that aren't willing to come to school and they'll never improve. Arlington is an elementary middle. So, you know, in order to get these students prepared for high school, it has to start with them showing up to school. It has to start with them participating. So they're, you know, these, some of these young students are trying to overcome a lot, of, a lot of the trauma that they're facing in their communities and a lot of the food insecurity and a lot of the poverty issues that they have. And so, you know, school has been their only outlet. So it starts, it starts with showing up. And then at that point, you know, certainly those, those grades need to improve um, and, the, um, you know, and, and, and that needs to happen. But we need to prepare these students for the next grade level. And so, you know, if the grade levels aren't great, I, I hear that. I mean, you have some of, some of the most successful people I know um, had the worst grades in our, you know, growing up in school. And so, you know, that uh, grades don't necessarily determine what someone's success is gonna be but you can't succeed if you don't show up. Grades might not determine that. I totally understand that I was not the best in math class. That's for sure, and I hope I never have to do a math class again. But when it comes to the ed actual education, students, the national report cards have shown that students, the more time they spend in the classroom in Baltimore City Schools, the worse they perform, the worse their education levels are. So something isn't working inside the classroom. How do, we, how do we ensure that students, when they are showing up, are actually learning and getting the information that they need to, to then be successful? Right, so you know, it, starts, it starts with analyzing the situation and to understand what these numbers look like and, and to know, you know where things are, are working and where things aren't working. And we have a governing body of, of the system, of the school system, which clearly needs a lot of help and a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And that governing body are volunteers that are appointed and um, and that's not that's this this isn't like volunteering on a board, like that's not that's not what the school board needs to be. The school board needs to be all hands on deck, and needs to be uh, selected from the voters of Baltimore. They need to be elected, and they need to be paid. It's a real it's a real job, and that needs to be that needs to be a full time job. I mean that the school system budget I think is about 1.2 billion dollars. Uh, when you look at what the city the city's operating budget. A little more is two billion dollars, and so once you take out capital, you know some of the capital expenditures and stuff, it, the budgets aren't far off, mm -hmm. and so uh, that's a pretty large enterprise that needs oversight, that needs a board that's all hands on deck, that's that's accountable to the citizens of Baltimore, and and that doesn't exist today. And so when it comes to other agencies, right, there's a lot of issues. You know, when it comes to the water department, for instance, right? right? And so we're trying to tackle them. We're we're holding, we're, we're holding, we're holding hearings on the water billing and other water issues. And so, and so, when it comes to those water issues, that's something that the city council has the ability um, to hold hearings on and to push for change. And um, and we've been we've been making incremental change on that. Quickly, the time is winding down. I want to bring up trust in city government because the, the people of Baltimore have been burned by previous elected leaders, including mayors. How do you plan to restore trust in City Hall with the people of Baltimore? I mean, I show up, and I'm, I'm here, and I, I'm out there. Uh, when, when constituents call me um, in every, every neighborhood in the district, I show up. I try to address their issues every day. Uh, some things we can resolve, some things we can't, but uh, we do our best to, to address each and every one of, of their issues um, and continue, uh, and we we'll continue to come to work every day uh, and do the best that we can. Showing up is half the battle. Hopefully uh, other elected leaders will continue to show up and or start to show up and answer questions from the people of the public. And I appreciate everyone who is here tonight to, to ask their questions. There are only so, many, so much time we have in this town hall and only so many questions we can get to. 
we are here to listen and ask, answer questions and get those questions answered. When it comes to the city school board, really quickly, you mentioned as well the elected members. The next year, that will change. Do you think the entire school board should well, be that's, elected? That's only, I think, two, two members. Two members, correct. Yeah, so that's that's not enough. Okay. I mean, imagine if we only if we only elected uh, if we only elected uh, two members of the city council and the rest they were appointed. I mean, that wouldn't fly, and that shouldn't fly when it comes to uh, the school board either. The school board needs to be completely elected, mm -hmm. and um, and it needs to be a real position, one that we prioritize and we spend and fund. And, and fund. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Councilman, for joining us. Thank you for everyone who showed up and asked questions this evening. We'll continue to hold these town hall tours across the city of Baltimore. Until our next one, have a great night. I'm Dan Miller. I'm Kevin Stern. At Miller Stern Lawyers, we are honored to serve the community that we love. We work for you. For over a decade, we've spent our days and nights fighting for you. We believe in justice. We believe in fighting for what's right. That's why we are proud to sponsor a community conversation to make a better Baltimore. It takes guts to stand up for justice and accountability and demand better. And we can do it by giving you a voice in your future. At Miller Stern, we're fighting for a better Baltimore.